I have no problem with Yeah, I think uh, it's their choice. It's their choice, just as long as they don't enforce their beliefs on me or anything like that. Don't shove it in my face. I'm okay with whatever people believe in. Yeah, I'm okay. same. And as long as they don't, you know, use it towards or for harm towards others, because obviously religion seems to create a lot of violence in the world. And uh, I don't believe in organized religion and churches. They've been nothing but bad experiences for me. It's, you know, uh, I respect I respect everybody and their religions, and, uh, you know, I have my views and everyone has their own views, and I think that everybody may have the different take on things, but it, it all comes from the same pot, I think, you know? What do you think of religious people? I think they're warmongers. Okay. Yeah, I think they're very cruel. They seem to uh, be into hatred and, uh, and uh, killing. Tell me, what do you think about people who follow God? What do you uh, think of uh, Christians, for example? I think Christians are, are fine. Christians mean well. Uh, uh, a force of good in the world. One final question. What do you think of uh, religious people? who say they follow God and follow certain religions? Well, it's hard to generalize, uh, but I think a lot of them don't think things out for themselves. I mean, you have these people in the state saying they're Christians and they're endorsing going over to another country and bombing and killing people. So that's, they aren't Christians, right? But they think they are or whatever. So it's it's a mixed thing but I think in general I think many of them follow too much and think too little that's my opinion I think church is a place to house people who are prejudiced and negative and narrow-minded I've uh, really enjoyed myself here thanks so much for for inviting me to be a part of this I have had a lot of fun Thank you. Honestly, it, it's, uh, uh, it's been great. I, I love what this tour stands for and all the work you guys are putting into it. And um, it's fun and it kind of relieving to be around folks that share a common vision uh, and, and an understanding of the character of God. You don't get that everywhere. In fact, you don't get that most places. And I found that you can find people who, uh, you know, maybe belong to a different denomination than you and have a really a different theology than yours. But if you get to know them, they actually share more in common with your basic vision of God than many times people who share a lot of common beliefs with you. Uh, your picture of God is something that goes way beyond your official theology. You can have a theology that God is love, and yet your picture of God is actually very unloving. You just haven't noticed that uh, the actual vision of God that you have in your brain looks a whole lot more like nasty dad than it does Jesus Christ. So it's, it's been a, a, a real fun time here. It's also been educational. I, I, being around this, is some of the turns of phrases, ways of putting things, perspectives on stuff, uh, it, it's been educational. So I really uh, appreciate that. Finding your tribe is a precious thing. And a tribe is, I think, most of all about uh, finding folks who have an understanding of who God is and what the kingdom's about and the revolution that's supposed to be taking place here and that we're called to be a part of. I want to tell you a little bit about my own uh, kind of journey to discover a tribe, to set up my understanding of what Christians are called to be. Um, I went through a couple of years in this kind of legalistic Pentecostal church that I mentioned last night. Burned out on that, uh, and then gradually migrated my way back into what's kind of called evangelicalism. And by the way, I'm talking at you from a, uh, a United States perspective here. Uh, some of this may apply up here, some of it won't, but just understand that I'm coming from Minnesota. And uh, so it, it may be a little different than what you would have got here in Canada. But um, I, I, I became kind of mainstream evangelical while I was going to grad school. I struggled with some of the theology, but we worked my way through it. But there was always some things that made me feel like an alien there, and, and, and I, things that would raise questions to me. In fact, I, I could summarize my whole journey sort of this way. 
that the clearer I've gotten about who Jesus is and what he is about, the kingdom of God, the clearer I've gotten about that, the foggier I've gotten about what the church has to do with that, to be honest with you, which is kind of weird because I'm pastoring a big church. Uh, but uh, honestly, I, I, I've, the, the, the relationship between the two has gotten foggier and foggier. Uh, it started, I think, even before grad school when I was in college and I first started studying church history. And I, I learned about how when the church came in power in the 4th century and Constantine, the emperor, started throwing favors at the church and giving it power and allegedly became a Christian and the Christians began to pick up the sword and do fighting on behalf of the Roman Empire. And I, I read about how throughout church history Christians persecuted people and, and tortured them uh, you put them on the racks, uh, impaled them on posts, uh, burned the witches, burned the Jews, fought the Muslims and many times other Christians, uh, drowned all the Anabaptists, all in the name of Jesus. And, and the Crusades and the Inquisition, and we could go on and on and on. And as I read that history, I thought to myself, that's not my tribe. That's, I, don't want to build, I don't have anything to do with that. Part of me felt like, gosh, as a, as a Christian, I'm supposed to defend that somehow or at least apologize for it. But I don't think that has anything more to do with what Jesus came to establish than what the Muslims do. And so just because they did it in Jesus' name just means that it was more evil because not only did they do evil, but they did it in the name of Jesus, just thus giving him a bad reputation. And so I was kind of feeling out of place even with the, ner- the, the word Christian. Uh, my... Struggles in, in, intensified over time in the mid 80s when in America they started the moral majority. And as an evangelical, I, and I was at this point a pastor of an evangelical church, uh, at least associate pastor, we were supposed to get on board with that. Moral majority was all about, you know, taking America back for God. Like there was ever a time when we used to be for God, and I've always wondered when those days were. When, when were the good old God days? <laughs> was that before or after we uh, imported? Six million slaves, and half of them died. Was it before or after we slaughtered millions of Native Americans and broke every treaty we had with them? When were the good old days uh, when America looked anything remotely like Jesus, which is what the word Christian is supposed to mean? When did America ever turn the other cheek or bless its enemies? I, I, I'm just not clear on that. But we're supposed to take America back for God. And uh, the way you do that is by grabbing hold of political power. And so we had all these people lobbying, uh, you know, against uh, the Planned Parenthood clinics and lobbying against the homosexuals and a number of things like that. And it wasn't so much that I even disagreed with some of the political opinions, but there was something, I, I remember asking myself for the first time the question, this doesn't feel like Jesus, it doesn't look like Jesus. I don't remember Jesus ever doing that. Trying to make sure that Caesar does the right thing about certain kinds of sin. Not mine, of course, but other people's kinds of sin. Um, it's always other people's kind of sin. My sins are mere dust particles. Theirs are two-by-fours. Let's go after those sins. Those are the ones that are really destroying society. And uh, I don't remember Jesus ever doing that. And I suspect if he did do that, he'd have a whole lot fewer tax collectors and prostitutes hanging out with him. Hey, let's go hang out with the guy who's always trying to make life more difficult for us. Um, but I, so I, I began to feel alienated in the evangelical tribe. It increased in the 90s. I remember I was one time at a July 4th celebration, and I share a little of this in the book Myth of a Christian Nation. Um, at a July 4th celebration, 1992, and I did a seminar. It was an all-day-long thing about a lot of topics. I did a seminar on marriage and something like that. And then at the end of the all-day-long seminar, we had a celebration in this giant sanctuary of this giant mega church. And you walk in, and there's a giant cross next to a giant flag, American flag. And uh, uh, this is going to be a July 4th celebration, which itself is a little bit ironic, because we're celebrating the fact that our Christian soldiers killed more of the British Christian soldiers, and therefore, instead of being under the Queen, we're under George Bush. And that's something that Christians are supposed to celebrate. Now, you can celebrate that if you want to, but, but what's Christian about that? Ooh, we killed more of them than they did of us. Uh, is that really a, a Christian thing? But I wasn't thinking that at that time. 
Uh, I now don't think July 4th is a Christian celebration, but back then I didn't even notice it. So I walk in here, and there's a flag, and there's a cross, and then they start, you know, singing a lot of hymns, patriotic hymns. God bless America, land that. And then they mix it in with, on a hill far away. And then they go back to, uh, my country, tis of thee. And then they go back into, amazing grace, how sweet. So they're mixing up the hymns uh, along with the, the Christian or the, the American uh, nationalistic hymns. And that was already making me feel a little uncomfortable. I, I'd seen stuff like that before, but never quite this intense. But the real kicker came, and, th- and this was something that kind of began to crack my worldview. Um, really set me on a trajectory that's since got me in a whole lot of trouble, but I'm happy for it. Uh, where uh, at the end of this, they, they had a giant screen come down. And there was a military general that uh, came on the screen. Uh, who was under investigation for illegally se- selling uh, arms uh, to uh, uh, some, some of the uh, folks in El Salvador. Uh, but uh, he was also a, a, a self-proclaimed Christian, and was, he starts on this talk about how God has blessed America. Even from the beginning, we've seen how God has uniquely blessed America. And the proof of it is that we win so many wars, which is the most pagan way of deciding whose God is stronger. But you know that our God is the true God because look how many people that we are able to beat up and they don't beat up us. And then we talked about the recent Iraq war and how God's hand was so visible in that war uh, as evidenced by the fact that there was no casualties. Now immediately I'm thinking, I guess their casualties aren't real human casualties uh, that we don't even bother mentioning, but we're just going to thank God that our soldiers were, were, were uh, uh, all safe. And uh, the, as he's talking, the music crescendos. There's a flag in the background, kind of a silhouette of a flag waving in the background, American flag. And he's talking, the, the, this military music is louder and louder and louder. His voice you know, starts to crescendo. And finally he ends by saying, God bless America. And just then, uh, while the giant flag behind him, he fades out. This giant flag, uh, there appears a, a hill, a silhouette of a hill with three crosses on the hill. So you've got the flag and now this hill, which is c- c- clearly Calvary. And then four fighter jets fly down right over the three crosses and spread apart in military formation. And then it freeze frames. And the, mil- the music now is just at a peak. And then this slogan that comes across the front of this uh, screen that says, God bless America. And the crowd stands up and was screaming and cheering. There were cat calls. Some people were, were, were wiping their eyes because the tears, it was so moving to them. And I also had tears in my eyes, but for very different reasons. Because I was thinking to myself, how on earth did we get here? How did we get to the point? Whatever opinions you have about this or that war, it does not interest me in the least. But how did a band of people who follow Jesus get to the point where we are celebrating killing machines in the same breath that we're celebrating the cross? How did the cross ever get associated with with jets that are designed to bomb the people that we're supposed to be loving and serving? And they they were just so excited. And it reminded me of a thing I'd seen recently, a documentary about the Taliban who had just destroyed all of these, these, these uh, statues and stuff in Afghanistan back in the early 90s. All these Buddhist temples were destroyed and all these things that had been around for, for hundreds and thousands of years that were destroyed in the name of Allah. And this one documentary had them then shooting their guns in the air and they were screaming and, and, and shouting Allah Akbar and all that kind of stuff. And I thought to myself, this is exactly like that. It's just that we're doing it in the name of a different warrior god. It's the same, it's the same mindset. And now I'm really beginning to feel very alienated from this is the tribe I'm supposed to belong to. And it's, 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 the clearer I get about the beauty of Jesus, the more I'm seeing how radically different that is from this. This is just tribal warfare 101. It's been going on throughout history. Almost every country has killed the name of God and country. That's just what countries do. That's not what Jesus did. And then, some of you may know this, but in 2004, uh, just before the uh, election down there in America, um, there was unprecedented pressure being put on conservative pastors like myself to steer the flock to vote in a certain way. Because we were going to take America back for God. It didn't work with the moral majority, but now we got the upper hand. Now we can do it. We've got all the Republicans in Congress, and the Republicans, everyone knows, are more Christian than the Democrats. And so we're, we're going to win this thing, and now we can do what's right for, for God and country. 
And there's such a momentum in 2004 and such pressure being put on, on Christians and on pastors to steer the flock, to have them vote in a certain way, and to get on board with all these different political programs. And um, most of the pressure was coming from my own congregation who was watching the television or the ra- listening to the radio, and, and they had all sorts of personalities telling them, make sure that your pastor is standing up for truth. And the truth is you vote this way. And uh, along these policies. And so I use it as a teaching moment, as a teaching moment uh, to explain to my congregation why we would never do that. And why we don't celebrate the 4th of July. And why we don't have a flag in the church. And why, uh, if we're going to pray for the war, we're going to pray for our enemies as well as our troops. And uh, we'll pray for peace. And I just laid that out there. Why is it? And I, I talked about the difference between two kingdoms. And how we're called to rally around the kingdom of God, which is very, very different from the kingdom of this world. And I laid it out in as clear as terms as I knew how to lay out. And the result was about, uh, about uh, 20% of my congregation left, about 1,000 people. Uh, I, I, I knew there would be a little bit of ruffling of the feathers. I didn't know it would quite be like this. Uh, because I was pushing a button, which in America at least is a, is, is a strong buzzer. Nationalism and militarism mixed with the faith is, is very strong in America. Uh, the church has always been there to bless our warriors and to uh, you know, christen the state as, as being of God. And for a pastor to question that is for many of these folks to go AWOL. This is what pastors are supposed to do. You rally the, the, the crowd around the truth of God and country and stand up for truth and righteousness to take America back for God. And so it caused quite a stir. All of that has been sharpening my vision of the kingdom. And what I've come to see over time is that the kingdom of God, Jesus, wherever he went, he talked about the kingdom of God, the reign of God. That's what he brought into this world. He planted it with his life, death, and resurrection. And now it's, it's a mustard seed that's growing in each one of our lives. And that kingdom of God, it's not a religion. It's not any kind of organization. It, is the, it, it, it is, consists of all those who are submitted to the Father and who's the, in whom the life and character of the Father is growing. And so they are increasingly looking like Jesus. The kingdom always looks like Jesus. Wherever Jesus went, he said, the kingdom of God is with you. And the reason was because he was the kingdom of God. He incarnated uh, uh, God and therefore incarnated what it looks like when a human being is fully and completely surrendered to the Father. It, it looks like Jesus. And when we surrender our life to Jesus, his DNA starts to be fused with ours. He gives us his Holy Spirit. His character begins to work in our hearts and minds and change our desires. And gradually Christ is formed in us and we become increasingly conformed to the image of God. And wherever that is happening... We will individually and collectively look like Jesus. That is the kingdom of God. That's the criteria of the kingdom of God. It looks like Jesus. Whatever doesn't look like Jesus, dying on Calvary as he prays, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they do. Whatever doesn't look like Jesus, washing the feet of disciples uh, that he knows are going to betray him. Whatever doesn't look like Jesus, who is in solidarity with the poor and, and serving those who are marginalized and hanging out with the tax collectors and the prostitutes, whatever doesn't look like Jesus isn't the kingdom. It may be good and noble and true. It may be very evil, but it's not the kingdom. The kingdom always looks like Jesus. It, it manifests the servant heart of God. And that, see, that is my tribe. That's my tribe. I can't identify it as... You know, the Seventh-day Adventists or the Mennonites or the Baptists or whatever, I identified it with all those who, who, are, who, who, are, who are manifesting or at least aspiring to manifest the reign of God and in whom God's life is being uh, poured into. Amen. And poured out. It's a revolution. It's a revolution. And it may sound foolish to say this, but it's eventually going to win the day. It's going to transform the world. Not in the way the world does it, but it's going to transform the world. Like a mustard seed. Very quiet, very small, very inconspicuous, but it's growing under the ground all the time, one soul at a time. The reign of God is expanding. This is why the Bible puts such a premium on imitating Jesus. Over and over again, imitate Jesus. Look at Jesus in order to look like Jesus. Uh, live in love, Paul says. He says, be imitators of God. Ephesians 5.1 uses the word mimetai, which means to mimic. Mimic, he says, mimic God. Mimic, it means to shadow, uh, to, to do exactly what you see another doing. Nothing more, nothing less. Be mimickers of God. Now, how do you mimic God? God's invisible. 
Well, yes, but God became incarnate. So Paul adds, right after he says this, he says, be imitators of God. Live in love. Here's what it looks like if you imitate God. Live in love as Christ loved you and gave his life for you. Our one job description is to love as we are loved. To live in the love that, that God has had for us expressed on Calvary. And we're to imitate that. And insofar as we do and insofar as that becomes our character, we manifest the reign of, of God. Everything Jesus was about, we're supposed to be about. So Jesus entered into solidarity with the poor, so we're supposed to care about the poor. And Jesus uh, embraced the outcast, so we're to embrace the outcast. And Jesus set the captives free, so we're called to set the captives free. Uh, Jesus was radically countercultural in the way that he treated dignified women, so we're to be radically countercultural in the way that we dignify women and get rid of all the gender structures that are there. Jesus tore down racial walls wherever he went. Uh, man, if you read him in a first century context, he was radical, talking to the Samaritans, praising the Roman centurions. It was amazing. So we're to be radically countercultural in the way that we tear down racial walls and all the other walls that separate people. Jesus was radically free from any kind of classism, radical in the first century. He treated beggars as though they were kings. He didn't care what social strata a person came from. So we are to be radically countercultural and manifest the beauty of one new humanity by the way that we ignore class distinctions and economic distinctions and go out of our way to cross those lines. Everything Jesus was about, we're to be about. The way he loved is the way that we're to love. The whole thing is summed up in manifesting self-sacrificial Calvary love, agape love. The way the Bible defines love is by pointing us to Jesus Christ. 1 John 3.16 says, here's how we know what love is. That he gave his life for us, so also we should lay down our life for one another. That's agape love. It's not about a feeling. It's not about a warm fuzzy. It really is about ascribing, whatever you feel, whatever you see, it's about ascribing unsurpassable worth to another at cost to yourself when necessary. Though we didn't deserve it, we weren't worthy, yet he ascribed worth to us. By what he was willing to pay for us. You know what something's worth. You know, you, know, you go to sell your house. Yes, the realtor, how, you know, what's it worth? And the answer is whatever anyone will pay for it. Well, so it is with anything. You know what it's worth by what someone will pay for it. So what are you worth? What am I worth? Well, the only one who knows us really is our creator. And what was he willing to pay? Himself. Which means you couldn't have more worth uh, if, if you tried. You have unsurpassable worth. What agape love is, is simply ascribing unsurpassable worth to another at cost to ourselves. The job of a, of a follower of Jesus is to do that. That's what we're supposed to look like. Whatever we see or think we see in another, we are to agree with our Abba Father that that person was worth Jesus dying for. And we're to reflect that by how we think about them, by how we speak about them, by how we speak to them, and by how we interact with them. Reflect the fact that they are precious beyond measure. It doesn't matter whether we like their lifestyle or not. It doesn't matter whether we agree with their theology or their politics or not. It doesn't matter whether they're from our country or not. It doesn't matter whether they're a friend or an enemy. Our most fundamental job, this sums up everything, is to agree with God. This is what it is to be submitted to God. If we're submitted to God, it means we have to submit to his opinion of people. And his opinion of people, every one of them, no exceptions, is that they're all worth Jesus dying for. And so as we drive down the street and as we mow our lawn and as we go to the work office and as we get in an argument with our neighbor, our most fundamental job is not to win the argument or to be right. Our most fundamental job is to ask this question, are we reflecting God's opinion of this person by the way we're talking right now, by the way we're thinking right now? We have so much mind pollution, judgments in our mind. This is a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, so many judgments, uh, which is really gossip in our brain about people. We, we think that they, I mean, we like the way they dress or don't like the way they dress or the way they smell or the way they're the parent or the way, whatever, and we gossip about them in, in our brain. I remember the first time about 12 years ago where God, I was sitting in a mall just watching people and, and, and uh, all of a sudden I woke up to the chatter in my brain. I didn't even know it was there. I've always thought I was a real tolerant, open-minded, non-judgmental person. Well, maybe objectively I am, but in my brain, I had all these opinions. Ooh, don't like, oh, boy, that, that poor guy married to that gal. Oh, that person really needs that cheeseburger. Uh, oh, you know, oh, what a lovely couple. You know, there's positive things. Oh, I bet they're good parents. Ooh, man. I have all this stuff chattering in my brain, and the Holy Spirit in that moment, in that mall, 
really just kind of stopped me and said, uh, Greg, I don't recall putting you in charge of uh, having an opinion about everyone's dress and parenting skills and beliefs and odor or what have you. I didn't make you the arbiter of good taste and decent society. I, what was the job description I gave you? Oh, yes, it was this. Agree with me <laughs> about every person you see and reflect that agreement, not just by how you objectively and in your behavior treat them, but by how you think about them. And I found, I found when I got that chatter to shut up, and I've been on this discipline now for 12, 13 years, when I could shut that up and, 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 and just agree, every person I see, I'd look past whatever was on the outside and just say, Lord, I thank you for making that person. I agree with you. They have unsurpassable worth. Bless them. Lord, bless that person. And it uncorks this river of living water. This love begins to gusher out of you. It starts by obedience. You just obey. You just obey that, yes, okay, God, you, if you say that we're dying for, I agree. But in time, you begin to really see what God sees. And you begin to see the beauty that is there and the potential that is there. And now you're walking in the Spirit. And now you're walking in love. And it transforms everything. Every, every other kind of thought we have in our head blocks the flow of that love. But when we're able to shut that up and just start blessing people. Now, sometimes it's hard. Someone cuts you off on the highway. The first instinct, our fallen instinct is that you... <laughs> but you can train yourself to, when you start doing that, you just let it be a post-it note to remind you, what is your job? Oh, yes, it's to agree with God that that person is worth dying for. And now you use a little of the authority that you have as a child of God to bless that person. It's our first job description. In, in, in Luke 10, he says, when you ever, ever go into a town, first thing you do, first thing you do, I still think this is the number one goal of evangelism, is you bless, you pray, you play, pray peace on the house that is there. Uh, that's the first job description, just bless. Just be a blessing machine. It's so freeing, it's so freeing. All of our judgments in our head, they're all there because we think that we're God. They really are. That's why it's the original sin of the Bible. We think that we're going to fix the world. Oh, if only that person dressed this way or if only that person did this, the world would be a better place. As though we're the creator. We're not called to be the savior of the world or the fixer of the world. We're called to be the servants of the world. And the first way we serve is by praying and blessing and agreeing with God about every person that we see. That's love, ascribing unsurpassable worth. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16, 14, let everything you do, everyone say everything, let everything you do be done in love, agape. That means don't do anything if you're not going to do it in love. Let everything that you do. I often tell my congregation, if you're you know, talking with somebody, you get into a political or even more importantly, a theological discussion, and being right and winning becomes more important than reflecting the, the, your opponent's unsurpassable worth by the way that you're interacting with them, if that ever starts to happen, do the kingdom a favor and shut up immediately. <laughs> Let everything you do be done in love. So if you enter into a theological debate, do it in love. That's fine. Do it in love. Political discussion, do it in love. But let everything that you do, that means every thought that you think, every breath that you take, do it in love. Paul says, live in love. Ephesians 5.1. So you got to ask the question, when is the right time to love? Well, are you alive? Check your pulse. If, if there's a heartbeat, uh, I guess it's the right time to love. Uh, is there any breath? Are you breathing? Ah, this is the right time to love. Is there any brain waves whatsoever? Maybe at this time of the night, not many, but are there any brain waves going on? If so, it's the right time to love. You're supposed to live in love, which means with every breath that we breathe, we love. With every thought that we think, with every heartbeat, we are to love. There's, in other words, if you're a follower of Jesus, we got to know that as God's life is poured into us, he wants to flow through us, and there's no off button to that. It means we never have to make a decision about who to love or who not to love. In fact, we're never allowed to make a decision about who we can love or who not to love. The pedophile. I mean, you just hear about it on television. Everyone in the world hates the guy. Got that. And so, socially, they have to put him behind bars to protect the kids. Got that. That's one thing. But we're not to be defined by society. No, we're supposed to be the one weird, radical, foolish group of people on the planet who love even the pedophile, who love even the murderer, who love the, the unlovable. That's what Jesus did, and his character is being formed in us. There's no off button to love. Colossians 3 and, and 1 Peter 2 says, Above all, love one another. Above all. That means our highest priority at every moment is to love. Above all. It's important to have correct doctrine, but see, if you have correct doctrine uh, and it's not done under love, well, then you might as well be wrong. 
Uh, having correct doctrine, uh, been doing it in an unloving way, is, is the worst kind of heresy. <laughs> uh, above all, love. And if, if it's above all, that means nothing could, should be taken alongside of it. People sometimes say, oh, yes, love, 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 but we also need to stress God's justice, God's holiness. Well, yeah, God's holiness, God's justice, but how is that in competition with his love? You see, above all, love. And, and, and God's justice is just, if we're understanding it right, the manifestation of his love. His holiness is simply the manifestation of his love. And you divorce those things from love, and what you got is a monster instead of the God who, who looks like Jesus Christ. Above all love, that means the, the first and foremost consideration in anything that we do has got to be, is this loving? Does it express unsurpassable worth to all people at all times? Uh, Jesus says in John 13, 35, By this they'll know that you're my disciples by your love. And uh, in John 17, he prays the magnificent prayer. Jesus says, Father, I pray that they may be one even as we are one, that the world will know that, that you've sent me. God leverages his own credibility on our capacity to love in a unique way, in a way that resembles the love of the triune God. In fact, in 1 John, he says God's love is made complete, telao in Greek. It's made complete in us by how we love one another. Now, it's not that God's love had any kind of deficiency, but God's love has a purpose. And the purpose, it's completed when it's manifested in us. God is, his goal, this is, this is really the eternal goal, it's to replicate his own self among us. John says that people can't see God, but they're to see the love of God in us. Uh, we are the ones to make God visible by how we love one another and by how we serve the world. By this, this is how they're supposed to know that you are my disciples. It's a tragedy beyond measure that this is not what Christians are generally known for. I don't know how different it is in Canada, but that survey that you saw here was optimistic by American standards. Uh, we have seen, there's uh, uh, several polls that just came out, or not just came out, I guess they're about three or four years old now, but they rated uh, people, individuals, and social groups in terms of their favorability uh, in the eyes of, of people. And evangelical Christians came up second to last on this list right above prostitutes in terms of social respectability. And we're very proud of the fact that we're more respected than prostitutes. <laughs> uh, there's a book that's come out, uh, I'd recommend it. It's called Unchristian, which was just done, and it's all just a survey of attitudes of how people view, uh, how non-Christians view Christians. And, and uh, I'll, uh, I don't want to ruin the, ruin the punchline of the book, but I'll just tell you this. Uh, that uh, self-sacrificial love isn't in the top hundred <laughs> of things that we're known for. You go to any street corner in, in any major city in America, just stop random people. If they're not Christian and ask them, uh, what's your op opinion of evangelical Christians? And it's very unlikely that the first word out of their mouth will be, oh, those people, they are just the most humble, uh, self-sacrificial servant people on the planet. Yeah, see, it's almost laughable. There's an editorial in our newspaper uh, several years ago where the person, and this was right in the middle of one of our many, many, many political fights where the Christians come out and, and uh, have all the, they're, they're wiser and morally superior than everybody else, so they have all the right opinions about what Caesar should do. And uh, this person wrote a response saying, you know, in the light of this, what this person said, uh, I, I want you to know that I get up every morning and I pray to the good Lord and I say, I thank thee, Lord, that I am not and never will be a Christian. Um, when I hear all, them, all, all these Christians rant and rave with all of their judgments on us and how they're better than us, I thank thee, Lord, that I am not and never will be a Christian. Uh, th this is, you see, if love is the most important thing, then this is, th this is the, the greatest tragedy ever. Uh, if love's the, the all or nothing of, of, the, of the kingdom life, then this is the worst form of heresy. In fact, in fact Paul says this. 1 Corinthians 13, you know, I, I think we've maybe heard that verse on too many weddings to realize how radical it is. And we need to hear it as though we've, we've never heard it before. Because Paul there says, if I speak in the tongues of, of, of humans or of angels, but I don't have agape love, then it's altogether worthless. And if I understand all mysteries and have the gift of prophecy, and I can move mountains with my faith, but if I don't have love, then it's altogether worth it. I'm a noisy gong. It's a, it's a, I'm a clanging cymbal. It's religious noise. And uh, if I have all knowledge, and I even give my body to be burned as an act of altruism, but I don't do it out of love for love, then it's altogether worthless. Altogether worthless. And you do the math on that passage, and what you see is that nothing matters unless 
It's motivated by and is furthering the cause of love. Nothing matters. You can build as big a church as you want, grow as large a congregation you want, but if it's not motivated by love and doesn't further love, well, then it's altogether worthless. You can have the greatest revivals in the world, and maybe people are getting healed. That's wonderful, and, and, and maybe miracles are happening, and that's wonderful, and, and, and uh, you know, great music, that's wonderful, but if it's not motivated by love and isn't resulting in love, it's altogether worthless. It's not just that it would have been a little better if we would have had love. No, it, it's worthless. Uh, the only kingdom criteria that counts is love. I, that means if we're assessing our ministries, it shouldn't be how good is our budget doing or how nice is our choir or how eloquent are our sermons, uh, but it should be, well, are people, uh, are, are we operating out of love and are people learning how to love? That's the criteria. In Galatians uh, 5, he says the only thing that matters is faith motivated by love, agape love. It really is that central. And in light of that, we have to, we have to assess that to, to fail to love, to fail to live in love as Christ loved us, is to commit the worst heresy imaginable. Think about that. And what blows me away is you look at church history, and I can find a lot of people, millions of people, put to death for a lot of heresies. Either they didn't believe in the Pope, or they didn't baptize right, or, or you know, they didn't get the, 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 the sign of the cross right, or whatever. You know, the people are put to death for a lot of reasons in church history, but I never read one account of anyone so much as having their hands slapped for not loving enough. I mean, who's the bigger heretic? Michael Servetus, who, who wouldn't say the word eternal when he referred to Jesus Christ. He wouldn't say eternally begotten son. He didn't think it was biblical. So they burned him at the stake. Calvin burned him at the stake. Who's the bigger heretic, Michael Servetus for denying the eternal nature of the Son or Calvin for putting him to death? If love is all or nothing, I'm thinking Calvin was the greater heretic. It just blows me away how in in none of the creeds throughout church history do we even have love listed as one of the attributes of God. Something's terribly wrong here. But see, God God is raising up a movement, I believe, and he's trying to get us back to the, the revolution, the kingdom revolution that always looks like Jesus Christ. Where you don't put people to death, but rather you're willing to die for them. You don't cut people's heads off, you turn the other cheek. And you bless your enemies rather than taking vengeance against them. This is why Jesus said that the kingdom of God is radically different than the kingdom of the world. Radically different. There's apples and oranges. You can't compare them. Uh, When he was before uh, Caesar, and we read this a little bit earlier, Caesar says, well, are you king of the Jews? And, And Jesus says, well, my kingdom... You're not going to get this, pilot. but my kingdom's not of this world. Now, here's the proof. If my kingdom was of this world, my followers would be fighting for me right now. Because that's what you do in the kingdom of the world. You know, I find if the leader's in trouble, you kill for him. That's the way it works. My leaders aren't doing, or my followers aren't doing that. They're not fighting to defend me. Now, one of them tried. He could have added. Peter got carried away, took out a sword, lopped off a guy's ear. But I rebuked him. Because, see, that's kingdom of the world stuff, and Peter's still a little screwed up on that one. But I showed him how we do warfare in the kingdom of God, and it's not by cutting off our enemies' ears. It's by praying for the healing of our enemies' ears. So I healed the guy. My kingdom is not of this world. And, see, it's a kingdom that doesn't look like Caesar. It's a kingdom that rather looks like Jesus. There was a time when Jesus could have got all the power of the kingdoms of the world. Read Luke 4. The devil tempted him, saying, hey, look it. All these kingdoms, with all their authority and all their glory, they're mine to give. Now, that's interesting. The principality and power of the air apparently is, in some sense, the CEO of all the kingdoms of this world. I think if Christians, if Christians just believe that a little bit, we'd be a lot less inclined to equate our countries with God. Uh, no, no, you know what? Satan is involved in all of that. And so Jesus, he came for all the kingdoms of the world. He came for all the nations of the world, but... He said, I'm not going to do it your way. I'm not going to bow down and reverence you in order to get these kingdoms. I'm going to get the kingdoms. But I'm going to get them my way, not your way. I'm not going to get them by getting authority over people. Uh, You could have, you know, think of how practical it would have been. If Jesus would have grabbed hold of all the political power in the world, could have passed all the right laws, put all the right candidates into office, man, he could have immediately alleviated a whole lot of suffering. It would have been practical. But the kingdom of God is not about doing the practical thing. It's about doing the faithful thing. And the faithful thing always looks like Jesus. So Jesus, instead of doing it the quick way and getting the power and ruling over people, instead of being the right version of Caesar, Jesus says, I'm going to do it the slow, hard, painful way by going to Calvary. And see, he didn't just do that for us. He did that as an example for us. And we are called to get the kingdoms of the world back that way. 
Not Caesar's way. Not by gaining the power over people, but by exercising power under people. Uh, I've sometimes referred to it as towel, towel power. Because Jesus put a towel around him and got on his feet and washed, and got on his knees and washed uh, his disciples' feet when they were ready to betray him. That's the kind of power we have. It's not the power to rule people's behavior. It's not the power to control their thought. It's not the power to always be right and be wiser than other people and morally superior to other people. Rather, it's the power to change hearts by getting on our knees and serving people and washing people's feet, even when they're our enemies. So Jesus is taught, love your enemies. Love like the Father loves. Uh, this is what it means to be like your Father. You will be like your Father. Well, Jesus says he causes the sun to shine on the just and the unjust. He causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. Uh, that's how you're to love. That's how you're to be merciful. In other words, love indiscriminately. Love like the rain falls. Love like the sun shines. And you know what? The rain falls and the sun shines on our enemies. And so we're to love our enemies. That's the hardest one. That is, I think, the litmus test of the kingdom. Can you pray for your worst enemy? You don't have to feel good about them. You don't have to hang around with them. And maybe you think that society needs to lock them up. That's okay. But can you agree that they were worth Jesus dying for? To the point where you pray, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That's the Jesus heart. That's the Jesus spirit. Uh, folks, where I come from, sometimes they'll say, that's ludicrous. That's ludicrous. You do that. If everyone did that, the Muslims would take over and then America would be under a calendar. Is that what you want? Maybe at some point we got to start trusting God. I don't know. It's just an idea. <laughs> but see, of course, of course it's going to sound ridiculous. It sounded ridiculous. You know, but people think, well, whatever Jesus meant. I, I was on a talk show one time. And it was going pretty well until someone called in and said, I want to know, uh, do you pray for our soldiers to win? And I say, well, look, at, I pray for my enemies too. And I pray for the end of the war, which is going to benefit both the enemies and our soldiers. And, and this person said, you mean you actually pray for, for your enemies like Osama bin Laden and the terrorist? And I said, okay, I didn't make this up. Uh, Jesus said, pray for your enemies. And so out of obedience, I think we're supposed to pray for our enemies. In fact, it says, do, do good to them. And this guy called in and said, well, you're, just pray, you're praying for, a guy, you're praying for the, the people who killed my buddy in, in, in Iraq. I said, I'm really sorry about your buddy in Iraq, but that doesn't change the fact that Jesus died for these enemies. And this guy said, well, I don't know. Uh, and I said, well, you tell me what that means. He says, I don't know what Jesus meant by enemies, but he certainly he didn't mean Al-Qaeda. Whoever he meant by maybe he meant grouchy neighbors or, or you know, the boss that's nasty at the office. But see, in the context of the first century, in the context of the first century, you say the word enemy to Jews, and the first thing they think about are national enemies. They're thinking Romans. And the Romans were as nasty as Al-Qaeda. Uh, you know, we're mad because a guy drove, killed 3,000 people driving some planes into a to some towers. That's bad. That's really bad. Demonic. But the Romans would r routinely, uh, you know, just to prove a point, if there was any kind of uprising, they'd go and round up some innocent people and crucify them all. We have one account where they crucified 4,000 people at one time. They flexed their muscle to remind people who were in charge. And Jesus says to the Jews who are under Al-Qaeda, love your enemies. Love your enemies. Turn the other cheek. Never exact vengeance. If, you're hungry is, I mean, if your enemy is hungry, give him something to eat. If your enemy is thirsty, give him something to drink. Serve your enemies. That's ludicrous. It's foolish. It, it, you can't run the world that way. That's the kingdom of God. And it's beautiful precisely because it's not just the right version of Caesar. We're not called to have the right version of how to run the world with power. Whenever Christians have tried that, it's been terrible. You think we would learn from history if we haven't learned from the Bible. Whenever Christians get in charge, it's terrible. Not just terrible for society, but terrible for the kingdom of God. We're not called to be smarter than other people and wiser than other people and morally superior to other people in terms of how to run the world. We're called to do one thing. One thing, it's so easy, so simple. And yet, it's profoundly difficult. And that is to wash feet, to serve, to love, to bless, to agree with our Father that every person we see, no ifs, ands, buts, or exceptions, or take backs, every person was worth Jesus, God Almighty, dying a God forsaken death on the cross for. And we're to reflect that by how we think about them in the privacy of our thoughts how we speak about them to other people, how we speak to, to them if the occasion arises, and how we treat them, and to do it at cost to ourselves if necessary. That's Calvary love. That's Calvary love.
And that is the kingdom of God. And that will change people in ways that laws and bombs and bullets and policies can never change people. They can control behavior. Only love can go in and change a heart. And through that beauty, you bring people into the kingdom one soul at a time, and the mustard seed keeps on growing. That's what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. Amen. Amen.